Good morning, everyone. Today, we are celebrating a wonderful day, a day to remember. When I look at the word memorial, the first thing I think of is memory. All the things that we need to remember. And today, there are many people we need to remember in prayer. Because some of those people did not come home that stood up for us so we could live a life of peace and prosperity. So today we do need to remember all of those in our prayers. But thank God some came home. And a lot of those that are home are in our church. And I saw this week on Facebook many times that Mr. Billy T posted about us and remembering. And I promise you, I have remembered this week, and I hope each one of you have too. Tomorrow is not the only day we should remember. We should remember every day how much they gave for each one of us. So today, in honor of them and our country, would you please stand for the Star Spangled Banner? Uh, good morning. I'm glad that uh, y'all showed up here this morning. It's a special day um, to come out and um, recognize those who serve for our country. But uh, so this morning, um, I'll, before we get into our services here this morning, I'm going to uh, read a small verse of scripture in Psalms 20, uh, Psalms 128, starting in, I'm going to be reading, reading verse 1. So if you, uh, if you want to read over, if you have Bibles with you, you can turn to it if you'd like. Um, but I want to begin by asking a question. Um, what is fear of the Lord? Um, the Bible has a great deal to say about this concept. In fact, there are many, many wonderful blessings that are promised for the people who have fear in the Lord. But for many of us, this phrase is hard to understand, and it causes us to question, does God really want us to be afraid of him? Uh, but here's the key. The fear of the Lord is, the sa- is not the same as when you feel when you're, on a scary, when you're watching a scary movie or on your, when you're on a roller coaster or when you're in a life-threatening um, situation. But um, when you fear the Lord, you take God seriously. You give God the appropriate uh, respect, reverence, and honor for his person and his position. It also means that you live your life uh, understanding uh, um, understanding th- that God loves you. He will hold you accountable for all your actions. In other words, you know what God is and what you're not. Over, the, over and over, the Bible promises great blessings for the, for the man or woman who walks in the fear of the Lord. Psalms 128 verse 1 says, How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. How blessed, let me tell you. The rest of the psalm goes on uh, to promise blessings over our work, our family, and over our nation. Uh, When we have proper fear of God, he promises to bless our finances, our family, and our future. Um, All of us have reverence and respect for something, and there are certain things that we take really seriously. 
I know a lot. I know a lot of men in this uh, in the congregation who have uh, great admiration admiration for football. I bet all the men in this um, congregation could agree with that statement. But um, when the game is on, it it gives it has all their undivided attention. They don't care how long it lasts. They're not going to miss a single moment. And if they're lucky enough to meet one of the players, they would be so excited and honored that uh, they would call everyone to share the good news. Now, here's my question: Do we have that kind of respect for God? Professional football players and celebrities don't know us. Uh, they, they didn't lo lovingly create, a, uh, create us with a purpose, and they certainly didn't die and rise again to have a relationship with us. But God did. When we walk in the fear of the Lord, we live in a constant state of respect and reverence for God. We are filled with his gratitude and his goodness, and we begin to treasure the ama amazing privilege of getting to know him and to uh, love him. And if, one of, if any, of here, any of you here this morning uh, don't have a right relationship with God. I pray that you would uh, this morning uh, fix it here this morning before it's everlasting too late. Bro, Brother Mark, could you lead us in a word of prayer, please?
song is Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. So if you would at this time, if you can stand, please stand. Dream. 
Well, good morning. Like Isaac, I'd like to thank you for being here this morning, and I'd like to say that it is good to see you here this morning. For those of you who don't know, Isaac is one of our uh, young preachers that we have here. And a few months ago, the church voted to begin devotionals once a month or so, and uh, actually just start devotionals. And uh, they wanted Isaac to do it. He's a preacher. He's going to be stamped here in a few years with our church's approval and send him out to pastor. So it's only fitting that we should train him up to speak and to break open the bread of the bread of the word. And so that's what our church has voted to do. So that's why he's up here ever so often doing a devotional. It's not just that I don't want to give the welcome. I love talking, as most of you know. Um, but it is good for him to get up here. And so I thank you for allowing him. Thank you for uh, supporting him uh, as well. This Memorial Day, it's all about remembering. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning is a love to remember. Uh, several years back, there was a man waiting for a train in New York City who suffered a seizure. And this seizure caused his body to convulse out of control, and he stumbled onto the tracks. He fell. And about that time, there's a train coming, of course, as there would be. A 50-year-old construction worker was standing on the platform with his two daughters, saw the man fell. He jumped in there after him, grabbed the man. They rolled into a drainage trough, and just a second later, the train thundered over him. Amazingly, neither of them was injured, and of course, the man, the construction worker, was greatly rewarded. He got a, a, an achievement uh, honor uh, from the mayor. He got a generous donation from a business owner. He got a, pay, a paid vacation, and he got a year supply of uh, Metro cards from the Transport Authority, because that's what I want to do. He's, his boss even bought him a hero sandwich. That's what I'm in it for. That's what I want. He's very modest about his new status as the hero. He says, I just did it because I saw someone in distress. Someone needed help. And I believe that captures the spirit of Memorial Day. They saw someone who was in need. They saw a freedom that needed to be preserved. They saw a way of life that is unlike any other country around that needed to be preserved. And they gave their all. Not thinking about their families or thinking about their friends back home, but thinking about what they were fighting for what they were jumping in the way of danger for, and willingly, they gave their all. And so we, today we remember them, we remember their love, we remember their sacrifice. And so to do so, let's look first in the book of John, John chapter 15. We'll begin in John chapter 15, and we'll begin in verse 12, and look at verses 12 and 13. John records in chapter 15, he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now, the first thing I want you to see is this command, or this commandment, to love. Jesus says in verse 12 that this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You. Now, this isn't the first time we see Jesus issue a command to love. Over in Matthew, you can turn there if you want to, you don't have to. But Matthew chapter 22, the Pharisees wanted to trap Jesus yet again. And so they had heard how he had silenced the Sadducees, and they come and they gather together, and they want to trap him. And so one of them, a lawyer, a legal expert, asked him a question, and the whole purpose is to test him. And here's what he asked. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Which one's the best? Which one's the most important? There are roughly 600 of them. Which one is the greatest? If we can only keep one of them, which would it be? And so Jesus responds. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Jesus didn't say it was an option. He didn't say it was something that you could do once you felt like it. He said, this is my commandment. And he says, first off, the first commandment is to love the Lord your God. And he says to love him three ways. He says, first off, you have to love him with your heart. That is your inner self. Remember when Jesus was talking about treasures? He said, wherever you lay up your treasure, that's where your heart will be. That's your inner self. That's your, your desire. That's what you set your mind on, your devotion on. He says, in order for you to love God, you first have to love God with yourself, with, with your heart, with your desires, with everything that you are, everything you want to focus on, love God. 
love God with your devotion. Secondly, he says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul. That is your life. That is your breath. As his children, as his followers, our life should declare our love for the Lord. Our breath, every breath that we bring, or that we take, that we ex, uh, exhale out should... Uh, uh, can't think of my words. Anyways, it should uh, expel, it should show everybody else the love that we have for the Lord. It should spell out our love for the Lord. And then the third thing he says to do is you shall love the Lord your God with all of your mind. That is your thoughts. That's the things that you think. And so we have our inner self, we have our desires, we have the way that we think, and we have our life. Everything around us that we are should be uh, scoped, should be focused on loving the Lord. He said that is our first commandment. That's the great commandment. But he doesn't stop there. He says, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He says, so first off, you should love God with all your uh, heart, all your soul, all your mind. But then secondly, you should love other people. And that's the second commandment. It's very similar to the first one in that we love, but the difference is the object that our love is poured out on. And so, of course, Luke records this, uh, this uh, encounter uh, as well. And we see in Luke that the lawyer wants to justify himself. And so he asked Jesus a question. He says, well, who is my neighbor? Because Jesus has just said, you should love the Lord your God. That, well, that's, that's easy. That's, that's obviously our Lord. That's the one who we serve. But when he says to love our neighbor, the question now comes, well, who is our neighbor? And so Jesus tells this parable, and he's along, uh, to paraphrase, he says, A certain man went down uh, from, Jer- from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into trouble. He fell among thieves, and he was beaten so bad that he was half dead when they left. They robbed him, they beat him, and they, and they just left him there. And he says, by chance, it just so happened that a priest was walking by. Now, a priest would have been a religious person, would have been the, the one who was the embodiment of religion in their culture. And he saw the man, and he passed by on the other side. Saw that he was in need, saw that he was in trouble, didn't help him. He said, likewise, a Levite also was headed that way. He said, this was someone who was on the staff at Temple. It was, it was a Temple worker. He said, he saw the man as well, but... He passed by on the other side. He didn't help him either. But then he says there was a certain Samaritan who just so happened to be traveling that way. And he saw the injured man who was, of course, a Jew. He says that he bandaged him, his bandaged his wounds. He poured on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Now, there's a root that we need to understand this. It's not that just the, the Samaritan loved him it's not just that he had compassion on him that it hurt his heart to see him like this do you see how selfless this love is it says that when he took him and bandaged his wounds i very highly doubt that the man had his own bandages to care for so he took his own bandages he's wrapped this man up he poured on oil and wine onto his wounds i doubt the man had oil and wine it was probably the one who found him he set him on his own animal and he brought him to an inn and took care of him and on the next day when he departed he took out two denarii or two days labor uh, wage he gave them to the innkeeper and said to him take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again I will repay you isn't that interesting this man has the the purpose to justify himself and say well look who who am I really supposed to love surely it's not going to be everybody right And so Jesus, the whole point of his parable is to be like the Good Samaritan. That's actually what we call him, right? If we see somebody on the side of a road and we help him, we're known as the Good Samaritan. From this parable. Why? Because of the root that's attached to the parable. It's this idea that we see somebody in need and we have compassion. We have love and it doesn't stem from this selfish compassion. It's this selfless compassion that we're willing to expend our own resources our time, our money, for the good of the person who's been injured, who's been hurt. And so the the man correctly answers, and he says, the one who showed mercy on him is the neighbor. And Jesus issued one more command, and he says, go and do likewise. 
go and love your neighbor. It's more than just who lives nearby. I can think of four different types of neighbors that I have, and maybe you can as well. The first one are uh, those you know and talk to. Any of you have those kind of neighbors? Any of you have a favorite neighbor? Absolutely. This is what I was thinking about. It's the one that I know and I talk to. I know what he does. I know what his wife does. He knows what I do. Uh, what I do. He knows what Kayla does. He knows uh, how old we are. I know how old he is. I know him quite well, and I, I'm, I'm fond of him. I like him. I like seeing him. I like talking to him. I know him, and I like him. The second neighbor is those who you know but don't necessarily talk to. You moved in. You talked a little bit. You kind of know who he is. You know who his wife is, but you don't really talk to him all that often. You see him. You wave at him, but you don't really know him. Uh, you don't really talk to him that well. The third one's those you don't know, but you talk to. I have one neighbor. I don't even know his name, but we've talked. Like I said, I'm a talker. We've talked. He asked me if I wanted to wash his car when I was washing mine. Like, we talked, but I don't know him that well. And then the fourth one is those I don't know and those I don't talk to. Because we have those neighbors as well. We don't know them. I don't have a clue who they are. I don't know what they do. I don't know who's living in the house. Don't know them. And I believe that goes on to a, a greater scope of life as well. We have the people that we really like, that we really talk to, that we really enjoy being around, and we really like those people. And we're okay with the people that we know but don't really talk to. Right? We call those acquaintances. Right? They're, we know them. We know who they are. But we're not the best of friends. We're not the best of buddies. But then we also have the people that we don't know but we talk to. Maybe someone that you see every day. Uh, you, you don't know them, but you talk to them. You're, you're cordial. But then there are people that we don't have a clue who, uh, who they are. We don't talk to them. So out of these four groups, who do we love? It was a trick question because we're supposed to love all of them. Jesus isn't saying you only love the person who lives right beside you. He's saying you love your fellow man. And the significance of this is that this man who helped him was a Samaritan, and the man who was injured was a Jew. During this time, and I'm not sure since history there's ever been a, a, a divide between two different races of people. The Jews hated, and they would curse the Samaritans, and likewise the Samaritans would hate the Jews and curse the Jews. They hated each other. Most of the time, whenever they needed to go, that's why we see Jesus saying he needed to go through Samaria, that wasn't common. Whenever they needed to get somewhere and Samaria was in the way, they would just walk around it because they didn't want to deal with them. They hated them with a passion. Yet this Samaritan is on his way. He sees an injured Jew, and he does a lot of things. He crosses what everyone else thinks he shouldn't cross. We see the Levite, we see the priest, see the same person injured, and they're not going to touch him because that's not even crossing a line. That's a fellow Jew rejecting another Jew. But we see the Samaritan help this man who his race, is, his culture has been fighting against, telling him not to help, telling them that they're the enemy. And he says, regardless, he had compassion, and he helped him. I believe what stems into who we help and who we love has a lot to do with ourselves in a mirror. We like to see people like us. We like to help people like us. We like to help people that look like us, that talk like us, that do what we do. And so we, we will reject the people who are across the line or across the aisle or across the tracks or across the race because they don't look like us. Jesus says, out of all these three men, you know who should have helped them? The priest. You know who should have helped them? The Levite. But you know who in turn actually did something about his condition? The Samaritan. And so when the question becomes, who is our neighbor? Who are we to love? The answer is, whoever is made in the image of God. Whoever is our fellow man. We are to have compassion on them. We are to love them. And so Jesus tells us in John chapter 15, verse 12, this is my command that you love one another. And notice the bar that he sets. He says, as I have loved you. He doesn't say try to love them as best you can. He says, love them as I have loved you. Well, let's talk about what Jesus did. Notice in verse 13, we talk about the greatest love there's ever been. Verse 13, he says, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. No doubt, as John's writing, he is picturing the cross. 
Just a few chapters further in the book of John, and Jesus will be arrested, tried, and hung up on a tree. And so he's talking to his disciples about love, and he says, greater, than, greater love has no man than this, that they lay down their lives for his friends. Because what Jesus is ultimately about to do is lay down his life for his friends. And so he calls us this greatest love. Now I want to read from the uh, book of Romans, chapter 5. I got two verses I'd like to read for you. It says, Paul writes to the Roman, ch- uh, Roman church, he says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. That's interesting when we start to think about it. Because the first verse that he's just said is, Scarcely or rarely would someone die for a righteous man. Now, a righteous man is someone who's a good man. He's a just man. He's, he's righteous. He says, rarely would anyone die for him. Right? If you think of a just man or you think of a good man, would you die for him? He says, most of the time, you probably wouldn't. It'd be very rare to see someone die for a just man or someone who is uh, just uh, or good. But then he says in verse uh, 7, he says, yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. And so he says, for someone who does good things or someone who is a good person that does good works, he says, some people may dare to die or be courageous to die for. But in verse 8, Paul writes this word. He says, but God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul says, but God. Why? Because we think of the way we think. And we say, you know, I might die for somebody else. If we see a child playing in the middle of a road and we see a car heading at it, we, we may run and try to save the child, trying to, to help, the, help the child. We, we may die for the child because he's innocent, right? And so we, we look at people who are righteous or good people. They're just people. I'm not sure I'd die for them. That's what Paul's saying. He says even this good person that does good things or good works or donates his money to the poor, Maybe someone would, but most likely not. Why? Because we value our life. We value the time we have with those that we love. We value our time being alive. And so it's very rare that we see these two occurrences happen. But in verse 8, he says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He's not saying that He would rarely die for us. He's not saying that he would possibly die for us. He said, but here's the idea of God. And here's how God shows his love for us, for his children. In that while we were yet sinners. In verse 7, it's very interesting that he has this contrast. And he says, he talks about these good people or these righteous people. But in verse 8, we get to the ugly of the ugliest. He says, very rarely would someone die for a good person. But God died For the ugliest sinner alive. And that's something we can't fathom. We we can't understand that sort of love. We look at people all through history. We look at the Hitlers and the terrible atrocities that they do toward people. And we're like, how can God love them? Why? Because we said it a couple weeks ago. We like to level and and terrorize, put them into tears, different sins. And so we see murder as being absolutely terrible. We see robbing as as something that could be forgiven, but that's not what God says. That's not what God sees. In verse 7, God doesn't see any righteous men. In verse 7, God doesn't see any good men. In verse 8, God sees sinners. He sees people who have broken his law. And it doesn't matter if it's robbery or capital murder. It doesn't matter. A sin is a sin, and God hates it. He's not fond of it. It's not something he loves. It's not something he cares for. But he cares for the person who's doing the sinning. And that's the difference. No, we probably wouldn't die for someone else. And it's amazing to me that men and women put on a uniform and will fly overseas to defend a freedom that they're probably not going to be thanked for if they get back. And yet every day they put on their uniform, they get their weapon, and they go and fight the battle that needs to be fought to preserve our way of life effortlessly, selflessly. And it says God died for all of them. Every sinner. 
even those who thank him, those who don't thank him, those that remember his sacrifice, those that don't. He died for the worst sinner in the world. Why? Not because we need to be justified, but because he loved us enough to justify us. He loves you. He loves me. And so he shows his love toward us in dying on the cross in our place. I couldn't be classified in verse 7 as a righteous man or a good man. I'm classified in verse 8 as a sinner. But aren't you thankful this morning that God doesn't look at our sins and say, I'll die for this person and not this person. I'll die for this good person. I won't die for this righteous person. I'll die for her. I won't die for him. Aren't you thankful Jesus didn't do that? He said, I love every human being. I love every person. And so I died in their place. He says that he demonstrates his own love toward us. The greatest love we could ever look at. Yes, it's on the battlefield selflessly as, as a, a, a human laying down his life for other humans. But you know what he's doing? You know what he's fighting for? Is to preserve our way of life. No other country has there ever been where we can have the freedom to assemble for religion. No other country has there been a freedom that we can just speak freely about the government, about the leaders of the government, about whatever we want to without rep, uh, reprimand. There's never been another uh, country like this country. And so when they go to fight, they are fighting to preserve our way of life. You think about police officers. They put on their badge to preserve our way of life. We appoint leaders and, and political leaders to preserve our way of life. But Jesus didn't die to preserve our way of life. Jesus died because your way of life was not worth preserving. Why? Because it was dead in sins and trespasses. Dead in the law-breakingness that is sin. And so Jesus died so you didn't have to live in your constant state. He died so that we could be resurrected at the end, at the last day, so that we could have a relationship with him. John writes in 1 John, he says no, uh, that we love, him, we love him, we love God because he first loved us. You know, you don't truly know love until you know God. You don't truly understand love until you know God. Why? Because we can't love anything if we don't truly know what love is. And that's what Paul's saying. He says God showed us love. God demonstrated this example of love by dying for us. We don't understand any love when we don't understand the love of Jesus. The whole reason we can love God today, the whole reason we can love other people today is because Jesus first loved us. And so we're called to, in, in John, he finishes this little section, verse 17. He says, these things I command you, that you love one another. He told his disciples, he said, the world's going to know you, that you're my disciples, by the love you have for each other. The love you show for each other. We're not called to love the people that are like us. We're not called to love the people who are different than us. We're called to love everyone. Similar, different, the same gender, different gender. doesn't matter. We're called to love our fellow man. And our example is Jesus' love. He says in verse 12, that you love one another as I have loved you you let's understand this because so often we reject sinners because of their sin we see the lifestyle they're living and we see what they're doing and we say we, we can't have any association with them you're right we can't have any association with their sin right neither can jesus jesus can have no association with sin but that didn't stop him from loving the sinner the only way we can preach the gospel is if we have ears for someone to hear the gospel if I stay in this building and while all y'all leave and I keep preaching this sermon, you know what won't happen? There will be no ears to hear the message that I preach. With our lives, we must disassociate ourselves from sin. But we can't disassociate ourselves from sinners. And that's what we see Jesus do. He says, I, even for the sinner, even for the lowly, even for the one who broke my law, I love him enough. I want to change the way he's living. I want to change the way that he's living today. And maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you you're understand that your way of life just leads to destruction. Your way of life leads to hell and there's no other way. Your pride, your arrogance, your money, it, nothing's going to save you. The only thing that can save you from hell and from a, a 
fateful judgment at Judgment Day is trusting Jesus as your Savior. And the amazing thing about it is that you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to jump through any hoops. Why? Because Jesus has finished it for you. When Jesus was on the cross, he uttered this phrase at the end. And basically, the phrase is this, it is finished. Have you ever been somewhere in a hospital room with someone who is passing away? Have you ever heard them say, well, it's finished. It's done. It's complete. The work is done. My mission is accomplished. Not really. Why? Because they're not accomplishing any task like Jesus was. When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, he meant our salvation. He meant the way for us to be brought back into fellowship with the Lord God Almighty. That's the amazing thing about my God, is that he loved me when I was unlovable. And now he commands me to love people who I consider unlovable because he loves them just as much as he loves me. And so this morning, if you understand that you're a sinner and you understand that you're not righteous, you're not good, and you'll never be good until you come to the foot of the cross and you understand that Jesus Christ died to save you, not because of your worth, not because of your beauty, not because of your goodness, but because of his gracious mercy. That's why he came. That's why he died, so that you would be forgiven, so that you could be saved. Brethren, that's the ultimate sacrifice that ever could have been paid. Why? Because free Americans die every day, and they go to hell. Had Jesus never come, had Jesus never died, free Americans would still go to hell. But because he came, because he died, and because he rose again, we, as free Americans, bought with the blood of soldiers, can one day spend an everlasting eternity in heaven because of our Christ Savior. If y'all have kids, or maybe grandchildren, and I'm going to speak specifically to the boys, because I know how you, how you boys are. Y'all ever have stains on their clothes? Have you, did y'all ever put a boy in a white shirt? You didn't even buy them. No matter if the kid liked it or not, no, you weren't going to. Why? Because the first day they got home, the first time they wore it, you know what would happen? Wouldn't be good. It'd get messy. It'd get, sta- it'd get stained up. I had this light pair of khaki shorts. I wore them to school my first and last day because I got stains on them at lunch. You know what light-colored clothing don't, have, don't do very well? They don't hide stains. They don't hide things on them. And that's the problem with our life, is that our life is really like this white shirt, but instead of being perfect and pure and clean, it's been dirty, it's been messy, we've rolled around in the mud, we've rolled around in stains and food, and it's just got disgusting. And that's the thing, Jesus only lets people in with white shirts, right, with clean shirts. And of course, the shirt is just an analogy for our heart. Our heart's dirty, our heart's sinful, it's stained up by sins, by our mistakes, and it's made dirty. And so you can wash it in all the OxyClean you want to, all the bleach you can, but you'll never get these stains out of your shirt until you ask Jesus to save you. And then what happens is his blood is applied to your shirt. And the amazing thing about blood is if you put our blood in a garment, you know what doesn't happen? It's very hard to get it out. But when you apply Jesus' blood to your heart, to your shirt, to your life, your sins are forgiven. And actually, they're washed whiter than snow. They don't have to be worried about anymore. Well, you, most of us won't wear a stained up shirt out. If I had a stain on this white shirt, I wouldn't wear it out. It's just the person I am. And yet, we we run around in these shirts in our lives that are stained by sin, and they're messy, and they're dirty, and we don't care about it. Jesus died so that you would have a clean heart, so that your life would be clean, so that your life would be pure. You could be washed this morning whiter than snow, But all you have to do is come to the foot of the cross, say, Jesus, I need your saving. I need your forgiveness. Come and forgive me and be my Savior. And the amazing thing about it is he promises he will. Why? Because he loves you. Because of his love for you. Let's close in a word of prayer, and then we'll prepare for an invitation. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your sacrifice, Lord, that you came to this earth, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died a death, Lord, that should have been ours, should have been mine, a death that should have paid the price for my sin, Father. And regardless, you came 
and you paid my price. You took the death that I should have died. You took the punishment I should have paid. And Father, we thank you so much for that sacrifice, that you loved us enough that even while we were dead in our sins and while we were chasing after our desires of our flesh and chasing after the evilness of our hearts, Lord, you died for us so that we could have a relationship with you. Father, we remember your sacrifice, and we thank, we're so thankful for it, Lord. Father, we're also thankful for those soldiers who have laid down their lives to protect, to, to, to protect us and preserve our way of life, Father. But, for, Lord, during this invitation, we pray for those that need to respond, that need to place their faith and trust in you. They need to follow in scriptural baptism, Lord, or possibly join a church. Lord, we pray so earnestly that these decisions that need to be made, Father, we pray they would be made before it's everlasting too late. Lord, forgive us of our sin and forgive us where we fail you. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please?